Last week, mom shared a message at my request. She was, uh, it was sort of following up on her Wednesday night. Last Wednesday, she presented a little bit of the history of Living Word, where we started, uh, where, where we came from. And then uh, she clearly had some more to say, not just because she hadn't quite caught up historically, but because there was a sermon in there uh, that she didn't have near enough time to preach. So I asked her to, to do it last week, and she did, and it was wonderful. I encourage you to check that out if you missed it. The week before that, I'd preached a message about the early church and how they grew and how they dealt with growing pains, dealing with certain forms of church government and how they handled uh, crises that came up. And the message was called How to Do Church. And I felt, and I still do, that it was the right message at the right time, but frankly, I was worried that many of you would find it uh, boring, a little less than exciting. It wasn't a healing message. It wasn't a message about casting out demons or spiritual authority. It was just, here's how they did church. In fact, that was the message, the name of the message, how to do church. But to my surprise and to my delight, I received a lot of great feedback on that message. You really liked it. A lot of you did. So it must have been the right message at the right time. But I'm determined to bore you. So today... I'm going to start by reading what is perhaps the least riveting passage of Scripture outside of the genealogies, maybe including the genealogies. So I want you to open your Bible to 1 Chronicles chapter 26. Now, to, while I tell you a story that I've told before at, in a way of introducing this verse, when mom and dad were Ramah students back in 78, 79, that first year, when we lived at uh, 134 West Ithaca Place in Broken Arrow, there was, Rama had an event, I don't know what it was, it was some kind of a dinner slash fun night. Uh, kids weren't invited, so I didn't see this firsthand. We just, I guess, got to hear this from my mom and dad. And they came home, and, and one of the highlights of this evening was when it was three or four guys who were Rama's students. They weren't on staff, they weren't part of the praise and worship team, they were just students. And they came in these hokey kind of old-time country gospel outfits with string ties and hats that were too big for them and pants that were too short. And they played guitar. Did they play anything else? But they called them, they were this new music group. They called themselves the Trumpets of Zion. 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 Trumpets of Zion. And here's a little bit of history that really, uh, I think mom alluded to it, but another uh, aspect of the charismatic movement, the charismatic renewal of the 70s and 80s, early 80s, was uh, the music we sang. It was good, okay, but <laughs> I think since so many of us, there were, thank God, so many people came to this church and churches like us in the early days who were lost, who just came out of an unchurched background, but many of us, uh, myself included, came out of a church background that was lifeless. Uh, I did not meet Jesus Christ. I didn't have a powerful experience with the Holy Ghost. I knew the Bible stories, and I knew the hymns, and it was great socially, but it wasn't an encounter with the living God. And when we came into this charismatic renewal, uh, we did a lot of what I now refer to as throwing the baby out with the bathwater. If it had anything to do with our religious upbringing, then it was no good. And we got rid of a lot of stuff, including a lot of good hymns. A lot of those old hymns uh, were sung for decades and centuries because they are good. But we found it important. Here's what we sing. We sing the word of God. We take scripture and we set it to music. And there's some awesome songs. There still are awesome songs that follow that formula. Uh, but not a lot of depth to singing. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. And then it takes this awesome leap and says, This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is, okay, so we're just singing the scripture over and over and over. All right? And, you know, people got a little more. And it was a good song. It was a good song. And it's scripture. I don't want to make fun of it. It just, you know, could have gone maybe some places other, from, uh, other than there. And they were, but this was the main thing was we were singing scripture. So the trumpets of Zion said, we've got a new song. We've taken, we sing the word of God, Rama, right? And everybody's like, yeah, so we've got a new song, a scripture song. We're going to teach you to sing it. And the scripture we are going to sing is 1 Chronicles 26, 18, which reads, at Parbar Westward, forth the causeway, 
and two at Parbar. That's the old King James. And so they sang it. <laughs> and, and they're singing, and they're getting into it, the instruments and everything. At Parbar westward, and four at the causeway, and two more at Parbar. Come on! At Parbar westward, and four at the causeway, and two more at Parbar. And just sang it over and over again, which I think is hilarious. Because what's funny about it, of course, is that it makes zero sense with no context. What's not so funny is it doesn't make much sense even with context. <laughs> because to this day, nobody's sure what parbar means. <laughs> Depending on what translation you're reading, it might give a different word, but nobody's sure. But we're going to read it in context anyway. Because... I'm determined to bore you today. No, that's not why. I do want you to see something here, though. And forgive me, because I'm probably going to massacre a few of these names. But this is in, in, still in 1 Chronicles chapter 26, beginning in verse 1. Concerning the divisions of the gatekeepers, of the Korahites, Mesothelioma, the son of Korah, no, sorry, <laughs> Meshelamiah, the son of Kore, the sons of Asaph, and the sons of Meshelamiah were Zechariah, the firstborn, Jedidiah, the, uh, the second, Zebediah, the third, Jathniel, the fourth, Elam, the fifth, Jehohanan, the sixth, and Eliahonai, the seventh. Moreover, the sons of Obed-Edom, 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 Moreover, the sons of Obed-Edom were Shemaiah, the firstborn, Jehazabad, the second, Joah, the third, Sakar the fourth, Nathaniel, the fifth, Amiel, the sixth, Issachar, the seventh, Pulthai, the eighth, for God blessed him. I guess because he had eight. Uh, also, to Shemaiah, his son were, uh, to Shemaiah, his son, were sons born who governed their father's houses because they were men of great ability. The sons of Shemaiah were Othni, Rephael, Obed, and Elzabad, whose brothers Elihu and Shemachiah were able men. All of these were the sons of Obed-Edom, they and their sons and their brethren, able men with strength for work, 62 of Obed-Edom. And Meshelamiah had sons and brethren, 18 able men. Also, Hosa, the children of Merari, had sons, Shimri the first, for though he was not the firstborn, his father made him the first, Hilkiah the second, Tabaliah the third, Zechariah the fourth, and all, no, sorry, all the sons and brethren of Hosa were 13. Among these were the divisions of the gatekeepers, among the chief men having duties just like their brethren to serve in the house of the Lord. And they cast lots for each gate, the small as well as the great, according to their father's house. The lot fell for the east gate, the lot for the east gate fell to Shelemiah. Then they cast lots for his son Zechariah, a wise counselor, and his lot came out for the north gate. To Obed Edom, the south gate, and his sons, the storehouse. To his sons, the storehouse. To Shupim and Hosa, the lot came out for the west gate, with the Shalaketh gate on the ascending highway, watchmen opposite watchmen. On the east were six Levites, on the north, four each day, on the south, four each day, and for the storehouse, two by two. As for the Parbar on the west, there were four on the highway and two at Parbar, at the Parbar. These were the divisions of the gatekeepers among the sons of Korah and among the sons of Merari. The word of the Lord. I was reading the Old Testament straight through for the first time while I was a Rama student. And shame on me. I should have read my whole Bible before I went to Rama Bible Training Center. Should have done that before I decided I wanted to, to teach the Bible, right? <laughs> I should have read it, but I hadn't. I had read the entire New Testament and probably several times. It was marked up straight through. And there were parts of my Old Testament that were highlighted and marked up here and there, but I knew I had not read it straight through. And what got me doing it was early on in first semester, I had a class called New Testament Survey. And it, was, uh, it wasn't a preaching class. This guy was a teacher, and he taught it, and he taught it very uh, rigorously. And I found it exciting and interesting. It was one of my favorite classes, but I also knew that part of the reason I found it interesting and easy to attend and pay attention was because I was very familiar with the text. And I also knew I had Old Testament survey coming up, and I didn't have that kind of familiarity. So uh, after school, I had, you know, by... Uh, Whatever errands I had to run, I had, uh, you know, but 
time school got out, I had three, three and a half hours uh, to run any errands, eat some lunch, and any studying uh, I wanted to cram in there. Went to work at four in the afternoon, worked till about 12.30 in the morning, and then I would come home and read for an hour. I was determined to get through the entire Old Testament, and I wanted to read every word. And there were parts of it, like the genealogies, where it's like, can I just skip this part? And if for no other reason, I wouldn't let myself skip it because I wanted to say I read every word. And then we came to this, I came to this, uh, this part in Numbers where uh, this is where I got really exasperated because there's a, the, the whole chapter in Numbers about the offerings that were given by each tribe when it came time to dedicate the uh, temple, or the, the sorry, the uh, tabernacle. And specifically, uh, when it came time to dedicate the altar of the Lord. I'm going to read a little bit of this for you. I'm in Numbers, chapter 7. I'll begin in verse 12. And the one who offered his offering on the first day was Nashon, the son of Aminadab, from the tribe of Judah. His offering was one, was one silver platter, the weight of which was 130 shekels, and one silver bowl of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering, one gold pan of 10 shekels full of incense, one young bull, one ram, and one male lamb in its first year as a burnt offering, one kid of the goats as a sin offering, and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs in their first year. This was the offering of Nashon, the son of Amminadab. On the second day, Nathaniel, the son of Zuar, leader of Issachar, presented an offering. For his offering, he offered one silver platter, the weight of which was 130 shekels, and one silver bowl of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering. <gasps> one gold pan of 10 shekels, one, uh, one, 10 shekels full of incense, one young bull, one ram, and one male lamb in its first year as a burnt offering, one kid of the goats as a sin offering and as a sacrifice of peace offering. Two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs in their first year. This was the offering of Nathaniel, the son of Zuar. Guess what? It goes on for ten more tribes, and every one of them is the same. I could have gotten that information down for posterity in far fewer words. Each, a representative from each tribe of Israel came, and this was their offering and just do it in one paragraph. But I would have missed something. Because the peace offering, among those things in that list, was a voluntary one. It wasn't observed at a particular time. It wasn't required at a particular event. You could initiate it. If you just wanted, if you just, you could just come with your offering, tell the priest to prepare it. And this is what I'm here for. I just want to praise the Lord. I just want to thank him for an answered prayer. This is just, uh, this peace offering is a testimony. Or I have a prayer and I just want to offer this uh, along with my prayer. It was voluntary. And as long as it was uh, something that was appropriate, it could be anything. And the peace offering I noticed after reading through these eight or nine times was a big offering. And it spoke to me that one of the biggest portions of this offering, perhaps the biggest, was the one they didn't have to offer, that nothing particularly was required. We want to give all of these animals. Wasn't a huge thing, but it dawned on me that, I, that it wouldn't have dawned on me if it hadn't been in there for all those tribes. Or maybe they could have stopped at nine and said the other three did the same thing. <laughs> all that to say it's in there for a reason. So what about Parbar? This chapter, this whole chapter is about the gatekeepers, and it's perfect uh, when we're talking about, for instance, the maintenance crew, the security team, and especially the ushers, but it speaks to all of us. When we read through, in this case, Kings and Chronicles, the big name players are obviously the kings. 
uh, and also the prophets, especially the power prophets, Elijah and, and Elisha. These, these guys were very active during this period of history. Kings and Chronicles cover roughly the same period of history in the Old Testament. Uh, but it's, it's right there in the name, kings especially. This is the, this is the story of, of the, uh, the dynasty of, of David and then the whole, the whole mess in the northern kingdom later. But the whole nation of Israel, all the people, were supposed to order their lives by the law of Moses. But the tabernacle, and then later uh, the temple, was the center of the life of the nation. And the temple was a, big, uh, a busy, busy place. There was something going on there all the time. And obviously the priests were kind of the main dudes. But you had the whole tribe of Levi that was dedicated to serving in the temple. And we'll talk a little bit about what these gatekeepers did in a minute. But uh, I was, got to thinking about some of the stories mom was sharing a couple Wednesdays ago, uh, especially about Sunday mornings, how a crew had to get there every Sunday and take the chairs out of that room, set them up, and take them down every Sunday uh, as soon as the service was over. You know, it, it, we, we couldn't leave anything like this. Jeff Canfield, man, he was our drummer from day one, packed up his whole drum kit every Sunday, jammed it into his, good grief, he was driving a Monza. I don't know how he did it. Uh, and he would drag his drums down there and set them up and take them down every Sunday. When I was at Rama, I attended Grace Fellowship, Pastor Bob Yandian, he was here a couple years ago. And they had, in addition to uh, one of the best churches in the world, they had uh, a school, K through 12 Christian school that was considered uh, certainly a top tier, maybe the premier Christian school in the United States. Uh, and the sanctuary doubled as a gymnasium during the school week. And uh, every Sunday night, all those chairs had to be stacked and moved to a couple corners of that large room. And we're talking about well over a thousand chairs. This was a big church. And because of my school schedule and my work schedule, my involvement as a church member was limited. But this was something I could do. I had Sundays off. And I, so I went to church every Sunday night and uh, I stacked chairs. I stuck around for... Uh, you know, they would always say, any of you who can stick around and stack chairs, we appreciate it. And most people would leave. A lot of people had to maybe get up super early. No condemnation, but there was a team of us that stuck around and stacked the heck out of those chairs, man. We'd gather them up, and we'd, we had the little carts and everything, or we'd drag them. And this wasn't unusual back in the day. This was, this was a common experience for a lot of churches. In fact, I saw something on Facebook recently that cracked me up. Matt, do we have that slide? Let me get a tattoo that shows I'm a godly man and love to serve, serve my church. Say no more. Those are stacked chairs if you can't uh, see it. And everybody from back in the day immediately recognizes that. Thank you. Going from that gym in Ogden to this more permanent facility certainly changed things, didn't it? And it was the same with the tabernacle. There were a lot of things. The tabernacle was essentially a mobile temple. And once they were in and settled in the land that God gave them, and once he put his name on the city, then it was time to build the temple, a more permanent version of, still included all the furnishings, still performed the same functions, but it was going to be built and stay there. It changed a lot, but there was still plenty to do. Same with here. There was still a lot to do. Back then, it was more punctuated uh, flurries of activity, uh, furious activity, because right before and right after the service, we either were setting things up or tearing things down. But now we have a facility to maintain day in, day out, year round. And here's another thing. As I mentioned, the gatekeepers had to be Levites. This was the tribe that was chosen to minister before God on behalf of the whole nation. Now in the new covenant, we are all Levites. We're all qualified for service. 
From time to time, we have to have outside professionals come in and do certain things. If we need a phone line installed, we're probably just not going to ask for volunteers from the youth group to do that. We need people who are specialized in, in connecting with the things we have here. You know, if we're having a new air conditioner furnace, uh, air conditioner furnace installed or repaired, the alarm system, things like that. But the day-to-day -day stuff, that needs to be us. The week-in, week-out stuff, that all needs to be us. I say that. I know churches. You probably have heard of them, too. Uh, they're generally mega churches, and it's not all mega churches. Nothing against mega churches, man. If they're reaching 5,000, 20,000 people a week, praise God. God bless them as long as they stay on task and, and Jesus-centered. But I know there are churches uh, with, with uh, a certain amount of influence and a certain uh, budget uh, that allows them to do it. They hire professional musicians to play uh, in their praise and worship team, whether they're believers or not. You've, you've, you've heard of this, right? And I'm, I'm not saying it's absolutely wrong. I can't get my head around it myself. I'm, we're blessed. We have not just believers, but believers in our midst that are part of our church family who have the gifts and the talents to lead in such excellent praise and worship. Uh, some hire outside agencies to do the cleaning of the facilities. Uh, outsiders to come in and do all sorts of things. But ideally, the people of God take care of the house of God. And I know this is not the house of God. Where does God live? Where's the temple? You're the temple. I'm the temple. We are the temple. But this is the building where his temple meets. This is a meeting house for the temple of God. And when we do the grunt work, we are ministering to God's people and to God himself. Nothing you do for God and his people is insignificant. Again, Kings and Chronicles is about the kings and the prophets, but right there in the middle of it is this chapter about the ushers, the security team, the cleaning team. The, this is what the gatekeepers were. They maintained the temple. They made sure that all the furnishings were properly equipped, in good repair, clean, stocked in the case of the table uh, of showbread, all the items for worship had to be in place. They oversaw access to the temple. They, they, they performed that security function. They kept the place up. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There are two things to consider here. You were created. You were recreated when you were born again. You were created for good works, actually a path of good works that God has laid out before you to discover and to walk in. It might mean that somewhere along that path, you'll become a missionary or a pastor. It might mean any number of things, but it is a path of good works. We don't wait around waiting, doing nothing, waiting for our opportunity to do the one big thing that, you feel God, that we feel God has called us to do. There's always work to do right here and now. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, you can turn there if you want. I'm just going to read one verse. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10 Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Now, Ecclesiastes <laughs> is a fun, cheerful book to read. Uh, I actually love the book of Ecclesiastes, but you've got to read it through the right lens. You've got to see where Solomon is coming from when he's writing some of this stuff. And he was kind of uh, far from God. He was still wise, 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 and he had some wonderful wisdom to share uh, I like the first part of that verse. There, he just kind of throws an Eeyore mentality on the end of it. because, well, might as well work now because you're going to die and there's nothing to do in the grave. But the, but the first point there is don't wait around for somebody to anoint you to do one big thing. If you find something to do, do it and do it well. Do it with your might. Put yourself into it. Invest yourself into whatever it is. You've probably heard this phrase. It's one of my, it's a very simple illustration, but it just makes such great sense. 
You want, to, you want to be led by God. You want to be moved by God. And it's much easier to steer a moving vehicle than it is a stopped one. That was an illustration that made a lot, that was a lot easier to grasp before power steering because you can certainly turn the wheel on a car with power steering fairly easily, but you don't change the direction of that vehicle. You might be pointing the wheels a different way, but you're not steering it. You're not guiding it. To be guided, you have to move. So get moving on something. See a need and do what you can to meet that need and let God guide you through that service. And seeing a need and meeting it, just so you know, that's different from the ministry of criticism. We have a lot of people with that gift. I should say, there are a lot of people with that gift in the body of Christ. Thankfully, we don't have an abundance of them here. But I, I kid you not. I think I've told you this story before. Uh, a, a young man, a young, young man. I mean, he was, you know, married with a family, young family. And uh, he wasn't a member of this church, but he was visiting. And he came in uh, to visit me because uh, we had known each other somehow. And he said he thought what God was calling him to do was to travel around, visit different churches, sit in on a service at least, maybe two, and then tell the pastor what was wrong with their church so that they could fix it and then move on down the road. And I, brother, please don't, please don't answer that call. <laughs> Number one, yeah, God does put people in our lives to point out things. You know, it, it's a very antiseptic term to, call, to talk about a accountability partners. I just prefer brother in the Lord, somebody who's invested in my life to the point where I can receive from them, uh, who can correct me on some things, and who can correct things about the church. Uh, certainly, there need to be voices there. But I got to tell you, it's the easiest thing in the world if your assignment is to go somewhere and find something wrong. Can you imagine an easier job? And especially if that's your job, if you think that's what you're called to do, I found three things wrong, here they are, see ya. Um, I've shared this before too. Uh, when, when my first uh, occupational ministry job working for Canaan Land Ministries in southern Alabama, uh, the head of the organization, head of the ministry was Mac Gober, but the executive director, a guy named Pastor Dave Robinson, great organized guy, man of great vision. He pastored a, a largish Assembly of God Church in Chicago before he came down there to work. And he had, uh, he had a rule, among others, he had some great uh, wisdom when it came to leadership. But one of the rules he had was, you know, we, we need, he said, not all of us see everything. So if you see something wrong, you know, we, 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 we can't fix it if we don't know it's wrong. But you're not allowed to bring something that's wrong to anybody's attention unless you have thought of at least three possible solutions. Maybe you can't see how to make these solutions happen, but I need to know you are solution-minded because flat-out criticism doesn't help anybody. Ephesians chapter 4. Let's get back on track here. Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 11. He's talking about the ascension gifts or the ministry gifts. And he himself, Ephesians 4.11, and he, Jesus, himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. What did he give them for? For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. Let me stop there and point out something in case there is a handful of people, and there probably are, who've never had this pointed out before. It's not for the equipping of the saints and for the work of ministry. It is for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. The, the uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, those offices were given to the church so that the church could be equipped to do the work of ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Here it is. Highlight this verse. Do something to separate it from the rest of it because this is the center of it, in my opinion, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, 
according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. This is what it's all building up to. How does this work? How does church work? When every joint, when every part is supplying what it's supposed to supply. Everybody does their share. And what's the result? Growth. The growth of the body, the edification of the body. It's all ministry, the work of ministry. It all causes growth and edification. The boy who offered his loaves and fishes paid, played a significant role in one of the most famous miracles Jesus did. Lydia, in the book of Acts, she was apparently a very successful businesswoman. And she was the first convert recorded in Philippi. She's mentioned by name. Not because she led evangelistic crusades, but because she was hospitable and supported Paul. What about the people who brought Paul stuff and served him while he was in prison? You know, the ministry of helps is mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, right along with prophets and apostles and teachers. Do what your hand finds to do. And do your best not to see it as a sentence to be served or as a stepping stone to greater things. The best thing you can do is bloom where you're planted. Leave the rest to God. A man's gift makes room for him. I tell you the truth. When I was stacking those chairs at Grace, I was not hoping someone would notice and see how well and how energetically I was stacking those chairs or how faithful I was about doing it week in and week out, I was honestly just thankful to be able to find a place where I could do something with my limited time and my limited talents. These gatekeepers in 1 Chronicles 26 are given a chapter of credit here. And many are named, even though a lot of what is written about is their geographical assignment. They stood on this side, they stood on that side. These guys were at Parbar on the west. But that's still a pretty good deal to wind up in the Bible, isn't it? I think it's a good deal. <laughs> so when we announce that we need help with meals, with children's ministry, with cleaning, weeding, sprucing up the place, packing boxes, anything, it is a call to ministry. You are ministering to God and ministering to the body of Christ when you answer those calls. I know I don't do a great job of publicly appreciating everybody who serves, but I do appreciate you. But much more importantly, of infinitely greater importance, is that God sees, God rewards, and God promotes about promotion. Keep in mind that what God rewards us for is not in comparison with what anybody else has done. We are rewarded based on how we responded to what he has called us to do. I simply do not believe, cannot believe, that on the day we stand before Christ in judgment, he's going to say, all right, here you all are. I'm going to reward you all. But first, all of you occupational ministers, you full-timer, I want all the apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers over here. And then I'll deal with the, the lesser rewards. No. Anybody who's walking in those offices should be walking in those offices because God called them to do it, and they'll be rewarded for answering that call. You answer the call, and you bloom where you're planted. You do what your hand finds to do, and your reward is the same. Okay? I'm not going to be rewarded based on how many people I got saved compared to Billy Graham, unless I've missed out on the call, and I'm actually supposed to be preaching to 50,000 people at a time. I'm called to pastor Living Word Family Church. It's not a matter of, God can't hold me responsible to the same 
to the same level as he holds real ministers responsible, you better believe you're a real minister. Every one of you, every one of us. The question is not what did you do compared to Billy Graham or Kenneth Hagin or even Scott Millis. It's what did you do with your talents, your resources, your time, and your opportunities. Praise and worship team, you can be coming up here. What are your qualifications? You're a Levite. You're a member of the body of Christ. It's his blood that has qualified you. We just read in Ephesians, when he saved you, when you were born again, you were created and placed on a path of good works that God set before you. He has a plan for you. You're a Levite, you're a member of the body of Christ, and to do certain things in this church, for, to, to fulfill certain functions and certain ministries, uh, we might require that you be a member of Living Word Family Church. We'll talk more about that in the future. We'll certainly talk about it in the membership class. Uh, and uh, very excited about that stuff. Why don't you go ahead and stand up with me. Because when we're talking about being qualified, and if I say what qualifies you to serve, what qualifies you to work, in these exalted positions like sweeping off the sidewalk, pulling weeds, vacuuming the carpeting, a host of other things. I'm going to talk about being qualified to serve in the children's ministry. You think, well, what's the qualification? You confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You think, well, that doesn't sound like a good trade-off. i got to uh, submit my life to the lordship of Jesus Christ and what I get in return is I get to sweep the sidewalk or minister to a bunch of bratty kids uh, or whatever. That's not what it's about either. No. Let's talk about qualifications. There's a famous question. I forget what it's called. It's named at the Fort Lauderdale question. It's what it's called in certain circles because I think it was first phrased this way by Reverend D. James Kennedy, which is this, if you were standing before God today and he asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? What is your answer? What is your answer? This is a heavy trip to lay on you and most of you already know it. And it's a tough thing, honestly, to reconcile with a loving God who loves us so much that he gave his son to die for us. But the Bible makes it clear, scary as it is, that there really is a hell in addition to there really being a heaven. That there is such a thing as eternal separation from God. It wasn't what we were created for. That's clear. And that's why God went to such great lengths to rescue us from the sin that ensures or that, that, that uh, sentenced us to that, that second death. The bad news is there's nothing. He didn't give us a list. Hey, I want you back. I want you in heaven someday. So here's 10 things you just got to do. Or here's 100 things. Or here's a million things. He could have done anything. But nothing we can do, the Bible's clear about this too, qualifies us for heaven, qualifies us for his presence. Nothing we can do. The only thing that can qualify us for his presence is perfect righteousness. And that is only available through the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's another thing that, thank God, you don't have to dig through the scriptures and come up with some mysterious connections. It's stated plainly that God places us in Christ and we are clothed with his righteousness. Should we be striving to live lives that are free from sin? You better believe it. Are we going to get there this side of heaven? I don't believe it. We should be getting better. We think, well, how much better do I have to get? Because Jesus is coming back for a bride without spot or blemish or wrinkle. You know what has spots and blemishes and wrinkles? The gown, the clothes, 
What are we clothed with? The righteousness of Jesus Christ. Spotless, free of blemish, free of wrinkle. He's the one who makes us beautiful. He's the one who qualifies us for God's presence. And in being qualified for his presence, in being made new, receiving that, experiencing that new birth, we also become qualified to serve him. And it's an honor to serve him. It's a pleasure to serve him, but it's never a matter of, I've got to do this to make up for everything he did for me. I've got to do this to earn. He already did it. I love that old imperial song. Well, it's an old, old imperial song. It's old now, but it wasn't old. They were a well-established group when that uh, the greatest Christian album of all time came out. One more song for you by the Imperials. And there's a song on there. It might be the, the, the first song on the album called uh, Just Want to Know What I Can Do For You. And that's what it's about. You've done this. You've done this. I know. And there's a line that says, it won't even up the score, but it's the least that I can do. I just want to know what I can do for you. I mean, and I love that expression. It's just everything I'm doing for God is an expression of my gratitude and my thankfulness for what he's done for me, not to earn it. But you must experience, it, experience that new birth. The finished work and the shed blood of Jesus Christ is the only way God has made for salvation. This is why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There is no name given under heaven other than the name of Jesus by which man may be saved. If you would like to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, if you've never personally made that decision, today is your day. Don't wait another day. You're not guaranteed another day. We want to welcome you to the family of God. I'd like to welcome you to the family of Living Word Family Church. But the main thing is that you surrender your life to the God who gave his son to give you life. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Be saved today. I'm going to pray a prayer, and when I'm done praying, they're going to sing a song. As soon as I say amen, as soon as they start singing, if you'd like to make that decision, come up here and let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the gatekeepers. Thank you for every single thing that we are privileged to be able to do for you in this day, in this hour, in this place. Help us never to look down our noses at any opportunity you bring our way. Help us never uh, to be haughty and consider anything anybody else is doing as less than what we're doing or somebody else is doing. Let, let's get out of this toxic cycle of comparison with one another and simply focus on what you've called us to do and rejoice in what you've called us to do. Thank you for strength and life and breath and everything you've given us to empower us to do the things you've called to do. And Father, thank you for Jesus. It's my prayer now, Lord, if there's anybody in the sound of my voice who has never made Jesus Christ their Lord, has never come to know you as Father through the finished work and shed blood of your dear Son, that they would come to know you today, that you would convict them of their need for salvation and stir in them a desire for salvation and grant them now the humility, the wisdom, and the boldness to receive that free gift of eternal life today. In Jesus' name, amen. And God bless you as you come. Thank you.